Hey, what's going on, guys? Death by Corn Dog here. Today I am going to be doing another story time. Uh, I was reading The Silver Bear. I'm going to continue that, but not today because I do not have time for that chapter. It is really long. So normally I don't read two books at once, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, what I'm going to be reading is The Survivalist Total War by Jerry Ahern. <coughs> And uh, this book has a lot of typos and whatnot, so you're going to have to bear with me. So uh, we might as well go ahead and get straight into this. Here we go. Chapter 1. Now! Rourke shouted, pushing himself up from a low crouch and waving his left arm. He burst into a long-strided, loping run down the steep gravel embankment, past the scattered granite outcroppings and toward the packed dirt highway below. The dozen men close behind him wore the khaki fatigues of the Pakistani counter-terrorist strike force. Fierce threats of death and violence issued from them. Small HK MP5 SD3 integral silencer, collapsible stock 9mm submachine guns in their ni white knuckled fists. They stormed the two dozen turban clad opium smugglers on the highway, clinging to the four stake trucks. As Rourke's strike force reached the midway point to the highway, the smugglers began returning fire. Oil-smeared tarps were whisked from then heavy machine guns mounted on tripods in the back of each of the opium-packed truck beds. Small arms fire bristled from the open windows and doors. Rourke fired the Heckler & Koch P2A1 flare pistol clenched in his right hand. His 26.5mm projectile soared high into the gray winter sky, then exploded. From his vantage point along the embankment, Rourke could see the heavily armored Pakistani military half-track moving into position and blocking the road about half a mile further down the mountain. Stuffing the emptied flare pistol into the outside pocket of the borrowed leather sheepskin coat he wore, Rourke swung his own HK SMG into firing position, then ran down the last hundred yards of the embankment, leading his men and firing. Already he could see the lead vehicle of the four-truck caravan swerving into a U-turn under the withering machine gun fire from the half-truck. Two of its wheels spun precariously near the ditch on the near side of the road. Then the truck lumbered back onto the road, coming toward him. Emptied, emptying the HK's 30-round magazine, Rourke crossed the road in a dead run, then hit the gravel on the drop-off side of the road, and threw down the HK. His right hand, then his left, reached for one, then another of the brace of stainless steel Detonix 45 autos from under his coat. Thumbing back the hand hammer on the scaled down 45 in his right hand, he closed his fist tightly over the rubber Pacmar grips. <sighs> he triggered one round toward the cab of the truck. The pistol in his left hand spit fire at the same instant. Both shots connected. The driver's body bounced away from the wheel. Rourke rolled back from the lip of the highway, sliding it down along the edge of the steep slope. The truck was out of control and careening toward him. As it rocketed over the edge of the road, Rourke fired his pistols into the fuel tank, and the truck exploded. The blistering flames of the fireball scorched his face. Glancing up toward the highway, clambering along the slope, Rourke spotted one of the three remaining trucks going into a skid, half climbing the embankment and flipping onto its side. The fortune in opium that was its cargo spilled out along the highway. The guard from the truck's passenger seat tried to climb out the window, but stopped halfway and brought up a stubby-muzzled submachine gun to spray the roadside. Rourke saw two of his newest tr strike force men go down. Dropping and skidding on both knees toward the truck, Rourke fired both the Tonics 45s. The sub-gunner turned toward him, and Rourke fired twice again. The subgunner's upper torso snapped back. The automatic weapon in his hands flew skyward. His body bent at a tortuous angle. Rourke got to his feet and ran down the road toward the two stop trucks. More than a dozen smugglers were exchanging automatic weapons fire with the half track. Grenades! Rourke shouted over his shoulder to the men running close behind them. 
There was a belching roar from one of the HK 69s. Its 40 millimeter high explosive projectile whistled overhead. Rourke dropped to the road, tucking his head down as the grenade exploded just yards in front of him. He glanced up as the truck exploded. Bodies and severed arms and legs soared into the air. The sky rained opium and bloody flesh. One of the HK 69s whooshed again. The second truck exploded. Pushing himself onto his elbows, then getting to his feet, Rourke shouted to his men, Finish him! His team closed in on the surviving drug runners. He fired both the Tonex pistols until they went empty, then stuffed them into the waistband of his trousers and reached to his hip for the metallified six-inch Colt Python 357 holstered there, firing at point blank into the chest of the closest of the drug smugglers, then emptied it into two more of the men coming at him. Using his empty colt like a truncheon, he smashed down hard on the head of the nearest of the smugglers, then wheeled around. A turban clan man with a long bladed knife charged toward him. Rourke side sidestepped. He dropped the python back into its holster. No time to reload. As the Pakistani smuggler charged toward him again, Rourke edged back and grabbed his A.G. Russell Sting IA boot knife. The smuggler slowed, then dove forward. Rourke sidestepped the knife and whipped down with his small double-edged blade against the right side of the man's neck, slicing open an artery. Wheeling again, Rourke drew his right arm up, deflecting a blow from another nearby smuggler. He lost his blade and now, tucked into a crouch, his left fist smashed up into the Pakistani stomach, while his right hand knife forward, palm upward, Fingers extended. The blow connected with his attacker's throat and crushed the windpipe. Then, wheeling around in, a, in the classic T stance, Rourke stopped. To his left, one of his men was knocking the last drug dealer down to the road with the butt of his subgun. Drawing up his shoulders, Rourke breathed deeply, turning and snatching one of the pair, spare six round magazines from a double pouch at his trouser belt. Rourke drops the empty magazine from one of the Distonics 45s into his hand, rammed the fresh magazine home, and worked the slide stop, stripping the top round and loading the chamber. Carefully, he lowered the little stainless gun's bobbed hammer and then slipped it into the speed brake holster under his left arm. As Rourke started reloading the second pistol, he glanced up at the sound of the familiar voice. Your men, and you yourself, John Thomas, were superb. A smile lighting the brown eyes in his lean, clean-shaven face, Rourke said, From you, Captain, that's the finest of compliments, but we lost two. They bunched together. I warned them not to. The other man nodded. Rourke added, but maybe the others will learn by it. You and I both know that the stuff that's hardest to remember is the stuff that they'll, that'll usually keep you alive or get you killed. You're right, John Thomas, but I think these men you trained will do well in this opium war we fight. The Pakistani captain, shorter than Rourke and with a bushy black mustache, lit a cigarette for himself, then offered one to Rourke. No thanks, Mohammed, Rourke muttered, then reached into his shirt pocket and plucked a tiny cigar and put it between his teeth. I'll take a light, though, he said, leaning toward the Pakistani's cupped hands, sucking in the flame of the match, then leaning back and exhaling the gray smoke slowly. He watched it catch on the wind and blow down along the road to vanish where two of the trucks still smoldered. Rourke ran the fingers of his left hand through his dark brown hair, pushing it back from his forehead. You still planning a mop-up operation here? Hunching his shoulders against the raw wind, the Pakistani nodded. I think, then, that it is goodbye for you to your men. Yeah, I guess you're right, Rourke said, glancing over his shoulder as he finished loading six fresh rounds into the cylinder of the python, then putting it back into its holster on his right hip. Hang on a minute. Rourke told the Pakistani, then turned and walked back up the road toward the ten men remaining from his force. The young military policeman came to attention as Rourke approached, but he gestured for them to remain at ease. You guys did good, he said. That's why you're still alive. Muli and Ahmed, they didn't remember what I taught you guys, and that's why they're dead. They were good men, no worse, no better than any of you were here. 
I want you to understand that. Surviving, whether it's a fight like this or just getting home at night in traffic, means keeping your head, remembering what you're supposed to do, learning to react the way you know you should, then just doing it. I won't be seeing you guys again. I told you, I've got to get back to the States. Maybe someday we'll all get together again. And if you guys remember that the first rule in this or anything in life to, is to keep your head. You'll all be alive so that we can get together. Work shook hands with each of the men, a longer handshake for the corporal, Ahmed. At first, Rourke had confused the man with Ahmed because of the similarities of their names. Good luck, pal, Rourke whispered, clasping his shoulder and returning the warm smile in his eyes. Here, he added impulsively, handing the man the Heckler and Koch flare pistol from his pocket. You're the team leader now. You'll be needing this. Rourke turned and walked back toward Muhammad. The helicopter coming for them was already looming large on the horizon, the distant whirring of its rotor blades like the drone of an insect. They waited together, Rourke and Muhammad, without speaking. The helicopter hovered over the mountain road a moment, then angled down and landed, uncomfortably close, Rourke thought, to the embankment. He ran around to the starboard side of the machine and slid in beside the pilot. Muhammad got into the back. Rourke turned and shot a final wave to the man he'd trained. They didn't see it. Already they were clambering back up the embankment, toward the mountains, to attempt to intercept the men who had been destined to receive and transfer the shipment of raw opium. The pilot swung the helicopter out over the gorge, and flew parallel to the mountain road for several kilometers, then started climbing. Rourke turned to look behind him, fleeing, feeling at the same moment Muhammad's hand on his shoulder. We're flying toward the Khyber Pass. It is not far. One of our border outposts was making its regular transmission. Then suddenly the radio went silent. We want to be sure it is only some sort of equipment failure. Fine, Rourke said, nodding, but dis dis disinterested. He stared out the bubble dome and down to the valley, four thousand thousands of feet below. After another moment, Muhammad said, Tell me, I've read your file, but how does a man become a weapons expert, a, si a survival expert, making a living out of teaching counter-terrorist techniques? You read the file, Rourke said, chewing the stump of cigar between his teeth. Like it says, I did counter-terrorist work for the CIA. His eyes crinkled into a smile. He'd actually been a field case officer in the covert operations section. Weapons, he went on, were just a natural part of that. I've always been good with guns, ever since I was a kid. Hunted a lot, like the woods, backcountry camping. Sort of led me into survivalism. And I read the newspapers... Scared, scared hell out of me, too. So I learned everything I could about survival. I was on a job like this once in Latin America, he said, finding himself shouting over the whir of the chopper blades. Anyway, he went on, holding the cigar butt in his fingers and staring at it as, as he spoke. Those were my wilder days. Back with the company, with a bunch of anti-communist partisans, I got ambushed. My right leg got shut up. <clears throat> Everyone else was killed. I was left for dead. I had a 45 and an M16 and a bayonet. No food, nothing in the way of medical supplies except some antibiotics. I couldn't get out of the jungle for six weeks. Then, when I did, the communists had already taken over the country and I had to steal a boat. Spent ten days in open water before I hit the Florida Keys. I was dehydrated, infected, sunburned, and had about everything wrong with me except athlete's foot. Athlete's foot, Muhammad asked. This is a, you know, between your toes, Rourke laughed. Ah, yes, we call it by another name. Yeah, well, Rourke continued, but in spite of it all, I survived. Pretty proud of myself, I was. I'd learned a whole hell of a lot, particularly how much I didn't know. Went back to reading everything I could going to every lecture I could, sorting through all the gimmickry and gadgets. There's more stuff to learn every day. But what is the purpose to it all? Muhammad said. Learning for itself is a noble purpose, to be sure. But, 
Nah, it's a lot more practical than that, Rourke said, lighting his lighting the cigar again and getting an angry glare from the tomb silent pilot sitting beside him. There are enough loonies loose in the world today to screw up the planet so bad that survivalism training is going to be the only thing that will keep people alive. Maybe. What do you need? A runaway laboratory virus? A global economic collapse? A world crop failure? Below them now, Rourke saw the familiar craggy geography of the Khyber Pass, the historic gateway from Afghanistan to Pakistan. These days, he thought bitterly, Afghanistan was a Soviet satellite or the next best thing to one. Mohammed leaned forward, speaking to the pilot. Take the machine down. I want to see our border outpost from the air before we land. Rourke reached into his borrowed jacket and took the tinted aviator sunglasses from their case and put them on, peering down toward the summit of the mountain. Ah, uh, Muhammad? What is it, John Thomas? Muhammad said, making a sharp downward stab with his right thumb toward the Pakistani side of the pass, directly below them now. Rourke almost whistled, whispered. Well, remember, I was talking about some of the reasons to study, study survivalism. I left out one. Probably the most likely one, as it looks from here. The Pakistani officer edged forward in his seat, his face inches from Rourke's right shoulder. The smile which he usually wore degenerated into a blank stare, then froze into a grimace of fear. Climb! Get us out of here! Mohammed shouted, bending forward to light his cigar again, staring down as he did at the endless column of Soviet trucks, tanks, and armored personnel carriers rolling across the Khyber Pass below him. Rourke said half to himself, Yeah, Muhammad, one of the surefire best reasons for survivalism might be World War Three. Alright, guys, that is the end of Chapter 1 of this incredible book. I actually am uh, on number 22 in this series. It's a really good series. Uh, yeah, hopefully I'll have time to read most of the books in the series, because I actually do enjoy them. Silver Bear, I wasn't too interested in reading at first, but I decided, okay, let's do it. I don't like the book all that much, but whatever. But uh, yeah, that is going to be the end of this video here. Uh, I'll probably do Sil Silver Bear tomorrow. I might alternate between the two. I'm not sure yet. We'll just see how things go out. But uh, if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and comment down below. Again, um, if you guys want to request some kind of book, you can. I probably have plenty of books that I can read for you guys, and I can get more. Uh... So, yeah, uh, I hope you all enjoyed this, and I will see you all later. Bye.